and it kind of didn't make sense to us that glasses cost as much as an iPhone. Um, just intuitively, that, that didn't sort of resonate. tell you a little bit about Warby Parker, our journey and, and our launch, and hopefully in the process um, highlight what some of the things that we're seeing um, just in the marketplace, whether it comes to building brands or, or scaling organizations in, in today's environment. Um, and the story really starts with eyeglasses. Um, I started Warby Parker with three buddies, Jeff, Andy, uh, and Dave, and we just love glasses. Um, but we didn't love the process of buying glasses, um, and we thought that um, something, uh, something you, you could just do it better. Um, and when uh, typically sort of you look to buy glasses, now they're, they're really expensive. And it kind of didn't make sense to us that glasses cost as much as an iPhone. Um, just intuitively, that, that didn't sort of resonate. Um, and, and the other thing that we kept seeing was that category after category was moving online. Um, so we had seen diapers start to be sold online, uh, engagement rings, sh sneakers, stuff that you never imagine. Uh, so we thought, uh, of course, you know, eyewear as a category is going to eventually be sold online. And so whoever does that is going to make uh, a, a ton of money. Um, and when we started to take a deep dive into the industry, you know, we found that um, people, when they buy glasses, maybe they buy Ray-Bans or Oakleys, uh, maybe they buy a fashion label um, like Ralph Lauren or, or Chanel. Um, they might go into a big chain like Lenscrafters or, and Pearl Vision, um, and they might use uh, uh, health insurance. IMED's the second largest vision insurance plan in the country. Um, what we realized was that this whole infrastructure is owned by one company, uh, Luxottica. Um, and, and the reason here that I highlight this is not to beat up on Luxottica, but what we find is that uh, when there are industries that are dominated by a few very large players, uh, you start to see uh, rising uh, prices for consumers. You start to see mediocre customer experiences, uh, like we were seeing when we would go and shop for eyeglasses, um, where the glasses were underneath a uh, sort of a glass display or on a shelf behind the counter out of reach. And I don't know if uh, any of you have ever shopped for clothing, which I'm sure you have, but can you imagine going to buy a shirt and you can't like physically touch the shirt? I mean, it, it, it's crazy. Um, and we also start to see low innovation. So again, when we were looking at this in 2009, 2010, less than 1% of glasses were being sold online, whereas all these other categories were now 10, 15% of the total market was being sold online. So we saw this massive opportunity. Um, the eyewear market is, depending on who you talk to, 65 to $85 billion a year globally. About a third of that is in the U.S. Um, so we just were super excited. Big opportunity, um, sort of low innovation. Um, here is just, just ripe for disruption. So the question is, how do you tackle this? Um, well, first is we need product to sell. So we started to design uh, the, the glasses that we love. and. Uh, we, we took an approach that's just like, what would we intuitively want to wear? Um, but also, how would we want to shop for these glasses? So when you walk into a typical optical shop, uh, there are 700 to 1,000 different options. Uh, it's overwhelming. Um, and a lot of research has showed that, uh, yes, selection gets people in the door. Um, but if you have too much choice, right? It, it sort of hurts conversion and impedes your ability to sell. So we started off by designing 27 shapes and two to four colors each uh, with the hope that we could cover the vast uh, majority of sort of facial types um, and still make that shopping experience easy and fun um, and one uh, sort of filled with discovery. Um, we then decided, well, we, gotta, we need a place to sell those glasses, so we designed a website. Um, and uh, as, as part of this, it was really about how do we keep this simple and clean and easy. We knew that buying glasses online uh, was not natural. So the question was for us, how do we remove uh, all the barriers to, to purchase? So from day one, it was free shipping and free returns. And you know, 
if, if we had our CFO hat on, it would be like, what are you, you're out of your minds. Um, but um, founders don't think like CFOs. Uh, they think about brand, they think about customer experience, they think about solving problems. And for us, the problem was that buying glasses is too expensive and, and not fun. So uh, how can we just make it uh, easy? And also looking at aspects like free shipping and free returns as cues to credibility. Right? We trust our product so much, um, we're going to pay to ship it to you and pay for you to sort of ship it back and return to us if, um, if, if need be. Um, and that was, again, starting in, in these beginnings, the, the, the beginning of what would lay the groundwork for our core values and, and our brand. Um, so the whole idea was glasses at a fraction of the cost and fashion at a fraction of the cost. So $95 with anti-reflective prescription lenses instead of the $400 or $500 that you'd spend for the same quality elsewhere. Um, now, we were um, at, at another uh, business school when we were working on this down in Philadelphia at, at Wharton. And we were um, sort of trying to figure out uh, how, do, how do we get this to work? And we would start talking to friends. And at first, they'd be like, oh, this is a great project you're working on um, and, and supportive. But then they'd say, uh, you know, I don't know if uh, you're, anyone's going to really buy glasses online. Because they're like, I want to touch and, and feel it. Um, and we thought that was no doubt going to be uh, our biggest issue going forward. So we figure, um, all right, well, how do we solve for this problem? Like, we need to help people sort of fit glasses to their face. So we thought, you know what? We're starting an internet company, so there's got to be technology here. So uh, we found this software where you could upload your photo and virtually try on glasses. And this is my co-founder and co-CEO, Dave. Um, I travel everywhere uh, with him. Um, and we, we, were, we were sort of, it was that moment of elation, like, oh, we've solved the, the problem. Uh, but then we start to sort of experiment and, and test ourselves and ask us this question, you know, would we actually buy just using this tool? Um, and we constantly found ourselves asking those types of questions, and uh, we ended up articulating it into one of our core values, which is to treat others uh, the way that we want to be treated. And granted, there's nothing novel uh, about that, um, but it, it will flow into what becomes the brand and, and the brand promise. Um, so we're thinking, you know what, this is good but not great. And it sent us back to the drawing board to figure out what could we do to, again, overcome this issue and this reluctance to buy glasses for people. Um, and it led us to this innovation, uh, a home trying, where people could select five pairs of glasses. We could ship it to them free of cost, and they have five days to try it on at home. And um, this was sort of monumental for us uh, because it uh, gave us the confidence to continue to invest more time and more money into this idea because it overcame that issue. And you know, you wouldn't come up with this idea if you were looking through sort of that that CFO sort of perspective. This is problem solving and a form of marketing, right? If if someone gets their sort of package of uh, home try-on kit, their five pairs of glasses, at home or in their office? Uh, are they going to talk to the people sitting next to them? Probably. Um, is it going to reduce our return rates? And since we're offering uh, free returns, you know that helps save us a ton of money. With glasses, lenses is often the most expensive part of the cost of goods sold. So if people return stuff to us, we have to trash those lenses, and those can become pretty expensive. So. Uh, this was uh, sort of massive for us um, and allowed us to, to keep moving forward. So uh, we sort of build this website, amateur mistake. We actually had gotten quotes from five different people to build our website. One quote was half the price of everybody else, so we went with them. Uh, six months later, we had to fire them and throw out all that work. Um, but, but we launched the website. Um, and um, we launch to features in Vogue and GQ, and the and company just uh, takes off like a rocket ship. And I think a lot of um, that was due to the, the way that we wanted to run this, this business, both looking at it from a brand perspective, from a customer perspective, but also from an employee perspective. What, 
type of environment would we want to come to work every morning where we didn't want to roll over and hit the snooze button? Um, and, and for that, it really came to this idea of how are we going to make decisions as an organization? Uh, and if being in business school, you'd think that we would be dogmatic, especially being at, at a school like Wharton, that's all about um, shareholder value. Um, and it is all about shareholder value, um, but when we're making these decisions that will actually increase shareholder value, we think that we need to consider these stakeholders in addition to shareholders, our customers, our employees, the community at large, and the environment. An example of how we were going to serve our customers was that we were going to sell glasses at a fraction of the price. Uh, that we were going to offer amazing customer experiences, um, whether it's free shipping, free returns, whether um, if you're calling uh, up on the phone, that the phone will be picked up within six seconds and you'll speak to somebody who has a mastery of the English language and is actually empowered to help you, because um, that's, as of today, pretty, a pretty novel concept, unfortunately. Um, when, when it came to our employees, it was how do we create this environment that we hope that they're going to thrive, um, where uh, we're providing transparency, feedback, uh, monthly informal feedback sessions, quarterly 360 reviews. Uh, um, I'm sure there's a lot of people in their organization. They have tons of millennials. We have um, uh, the vast majority of our workforce are millennials. And they want to know every single detail, every second of the day, and how they're performing uh, as well. Um, and we've tried to actually give it to them. And, and we find that that actually helps uh, everybody within, within the company. Um, when it comes to the environment, how do we mitigate our environmental impact? So um, every uh, year we're mapping out all of our carbon emissions from the production of our glasses to shipping overseas, to shipping directly to our customers, to the electricity use in our warehouses, in our office, and we're purchasing carbon offsets, put together a sustainability scorecard um, as we build stores and are actually we're moving into a new office to figure out how can we um, continue to sort of mitigate that negative environmental impact from, from building. Um, and then lastly, how can we be uh, a, a really sort of productive member of the community. And the best example of this is that even at uh, $95, there's still uh, about a billion people on the planet that don't have access to glasses. And we think that that's just crazy, right? Humanity is failing when after 800 years since the invention of glasses, uh, that they're not available to everybody. So for every pair of glasses we sell, we distribute one to someone in need. Um, and we try and do that in a, in a thoughtful way. Uh, because uh, I, I actually spent five years working in international development um, and was working for a nonprofit based here in New York called Vision Spring that would uh, go into the rural reaches of Central America, Sub Saharan Africa, and South Asia and train low income men and women to start their own businesses selling glasses uh, to people in need. Um, and one of the things that you often see in international development is that. Uh, sort of good intentions sometimes have unintended consequences. So for us, we actually don't distribute um, the glasses away for free. Um, we work with organizations like Vision Spring um, that are actually using glasses uh, to create jobs and create an economic incentive for people to distribute glasses over the long term. Um, and we think that that's more sustainable and, and ultimately has a bigger positive impact. So on a monthly basis, we tally up the number of glasses that we've sold, and we make a cash donation to Vision Spring to help them procure that number of glasses. They, in turn, uh, sell those uh, to entrepreneurs that they've trained, who, in turn, sell it to the end customer in their community. So um, with that, that sort of leads us to like what this stakeholder uh, model uh, really for us was about. Um, and the next thing was, well, how are we going to communicate this to customers? Because there's a lot in there. We're selling online. We have this home try-on program. We're selling for $95. Um, hopefully, they're cool glasses. Um, we're doing good in the world. Um, and uh, it just gets super confusing. As you guys know better than me, right? you have a split second to capture that attention. So we thought a lot about what is the hierarchy uh, of messages. Um, and for us, uh, we're a lifestyle brand. Um, we offer value and service, and we have this strong social mission. Um, and this is generally uh, the order in which people will find out those aspects of our business. Um, and that's because uh, we find, first and foremost, when people are shopping for glasses, they care about how it looks on their face. Second, the price. Third, quality. Um, and then, if at all, 
um, the, the social mission. That social mission is just because that's core to who we are. Um, I think that it helps customers be more loyal. I think it helps customers um, refer more. But I don't think that it's a driving decision in making that, that first purchase. So uh, sort of with this in, in, in place, um, we sort of launch. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, we launched to sort of a feature in, in GQ is February 2010, so about four years ago. Uh, GQ called us the Netflix of eyewear. They had our glasses alongside uh, Tom Ford and Bottega Veneta and Persol. Um, and it was just we, we couldn't have sort of designed this better ourselves. Uh, we were in vogue. And the company just. Uh, took off like a rocket ship. We hit our first year's sales targets in three weeks, sold out of our top 15 styles in four weeks, uh, accumulated a wait list of about 20,000 people. Um, and it's just evidence that in today's age, right, the, the internet is um, sort of once that spigot is on, it, it, it's on. And I think what we're seeing is that brands are able to rise faster than ever before, but they're also able to collapse faster than ever before. So the question is, how do you maintain that momentum in this world that's sort of changing faster and faster and faster? Um, and we believe that it's really all about um, customer experiences and constantly innovating. So uh, we measure net promoter score more religiously than we do our revenue and bookings, because we think that um, it's a leading indicator, whereas bookings is more of a, a lagging indicator based on whether we created good customer experiences. So we're proud that since inception, our net promoter score has been over 85. Um, uh, um, and we think that that also leads to word of mouth and referrals. Uh, and over half of our traffic and sales is being driven by our customers, our customers telling other people um, that, that we exist. Um, and that has led to sort of how we invest in marketing and viewing customer service, um, not as a cost center that should be uh, minimized and outsourced, but actually um, a, as a brand elevator and a marketing channel that helps us sort of grow. So um, with, with that in mind, uh, the, this idea of um, sort of building these intimate relationships, um, whether customers call us, whether they visit the website, um, constantly sort of telling people, not only our staff, but the world at large, uh, what we're doing, how and why, uh, we find that it just um, pays in, in spades. So uh, three years ago, we launched our first annual report. Um, and uh, it was probably one of the first annual reports that didn't have any financial statements in it. Um, and it was just a way for us to sort of record um, what we were up to in the past year and share it. Because, uh, you know, we want to build relationships with our customers just as we as human beings want to build friendships. And we find that the more vulnerable we are, the more that we put ourselves out there, uh, the deeper those relationships are and the more valuable they are um, from an economic standpoint. So the idea actually came from one of our designers who every year um, actually creates a little infographic for himself. Instead of doing a diary, uh, he puts together an annual report just documenting, you know, what he did over the course of the year. Um, for us, we thought that this was just going to be a way to engage like super fans. Uh, when we launched it the first time, uh, we sort of put it out there. It went viral and led to our three highest consecutive days of sales at the time. Um, and again, uh, this idea of just um, putting the customer first and, and trying to build these relationships pays off in, in droves for us. Um, uh, another example is that uh, we're finding that people are trying to communicate with us through all different means. And while it sure is easier if they email us, um, they want to call us uh, over the social, uh, over different social channels, they're now reaching out on Twitter. Um, answering a customer service question in 140 characters is really difficult. Um, it, it, it's a nightmare. Um, so we had this idea of, well, what if we just shot a short 30-second video explaining the answer, personalized it, um, and we would then tweet back at that customer uh, with a link to uh, a short video. Um, and we thought that this would just be a fun experiment. Uh, maybe the person would watch it. Maybe they'd watch it twice. Uh, we found that these uh, customer service 
like I won't even call them videos because they're like 30 seconds, uh, are being watched 60 to 80 times on average. So again, customer service as a form of marketing. Um, uh, we've also just really also pushed to, to use these videos when it comes to helping people to select glasses through our Home Try On program. Um, and you know, I'm often asked, uh, why have sort of you guys start to think about bricks and mortar uh, retail? Isn't sort of the world just heading towards more towards e-commerce? Isn't it uh, just switching even within e-commerce to mobile? And I think at the end of the day, um, the, the medium doesn't matter, right? It's the experience that matters. And we need to take a holistic view on designing those experiences, right? From the moment they hear about the brand to their first interactions, to their decision to shop, to shopping, again, wherever that shopping and however that shopping takes place, the anticipation of waiting for that product to arrive and then glasses, um, and then uh, uh, eventually using that product on an ongoing basis. Uh, when we were in uh, down in, in Philly and we were working out of my apartment, we started to get calls um, because within 48 hours we had to suspend our home try-on program. We ran out of inventory. And people said, hey, can I come into your office to try on your glasses? And we were like, uh, we're kind of working out of our apartment. Um, and we invited people in. Uh, you know, hopefully we weren't going to get you know, robbed or anything. Um, but we figured, you know what, we'll try this with, a, with the first couple people. And if, uh, if it works out, we can scale it. If not, you know, only a few people have had a bad experience. Well, they came in, and they got a chance to see the people behind the brand, which is so rare that we built these really uh, deep relationships. And suddenly, we were doing a ton of business out of my apartment. So when we moved back to New York to set up our first office, we made sure that it was centrally located right in Union Square, on Union Square West and 16th Street, in a loft with southern-facing windows with good light, but also public transportation, so it would be easy for people to come and, and shop. Um, and we started just selling a ton and a ton. So then we figured, oh, let's try some pop-ups. So we tried some pop-ups. Um, then we bought an old yellow school bus and transformed it into a mobile store and went to 12 cities over 12 months. Um, ended up being a, a great way to scout future retail locations. Um, and now we've actually opened up proper bricks and mortar stores. And our flagship is down on Green Street between Prince and Houston, right across from the Apple store next to Ralph Lauren. Uh, we've opened a, a few others in Meatpacking and, and Boston and in LA. And we just find that these are great brand experiences. Um, but also, if we're creating great brand experiences, then they're also highly profitable on their own. Uh, but we think about uh, sort of being uh, experience focused, but medium agnostic. Uh, so uh, just to leave you with what I think um, led us to be successful in, in a pretty short period of time, we're now uh, four years in, um, have about 350 employees, um, and uh, continuing to, to scale quite quickly. And I think it was this compelling narrative of this idea that you can get um, great design and great value at a reasonable price, and something is broken, uh, if it feels like it's broken, we can innovate, that uh, we're thinking about stakeholders, that we have this sort of clear sort of brand hierarchy, um, and just uh, being fun and creative, whether it's through our bus or our pop-ups, um, and then ultimately just goodwill um, that has really sort of helped us uh, grow quite quickly. Um, so with that, thank you, and looking forward to, to a little Q&A. Thanks, Neil. That was terrific. Thanks. Thank you.